Good evening. We're ready to get started, I think. Terrific. It's so wonderful to see all of you. I'm Peggy Hamburg, the president of AAAS, and don't worry, I'm not about to give another speech. Um, but I do have the honor, honor of moderating a panel tonight uh, with distinguished guests from literally all around the world. And that panel is entitled, Responding Faster and Smarter to New Problems, a really important and interesting topic. First, however, I have the pleasure of presenting one of AAAS's most distinguished awards, the AAAS Award for Science Diplomacy. This annual award recognizes an individual or individuals working together in the scientific and engineering or foreign affairs communities making outstanding contributions to furthering science diplomacy. So let's learn a little more about this year's awardees. The AAAS Award for Science Diplomacy recognizes an individual or small group in the scientific, engineering, or foreign affairs communities for outstanding contributions to science diplomacy. This year, we honor five individuals from the group that founded and developed SESAME, the first major international research laboratory for the Middle East and neighboring countries. The honorees include Sir Christopher Llewellyn Smith, professor at Oxford University in England, Eliezer Rabinovich, professor at Hebrew University in Israel, Zara Sayers, professor at Savanchi University in Turkey, Erwig Schopper, professor emeritus at Hamburg University in Germany, and Khaled Tukan, director of Sesame. Based in Jordan, Sesame, or the Synchrotron Light for Experimental Science and Applications in the Middle East, is a synchrotron light source designed to allow scientists to investigate surfaces and materials too small, even for powerful microscopes. Yet, Sesame is much more than that. It's an international collaboration involving several members that have had tense relations, including Israel and Palestine, Egypt and Iran, Cyprus and Turkey, as well as Jordan, Pakistan, and several observer nations. The project has overcome divisions to become a hub for research and understanding in the world's most turbulent region. It brings together scientists from all over the Middle East who are able to work together for increased understanding of the natural world. The lab's concept dates back to the mid-1990s, but it only became operational in 2017 following the tireless efforts of many supporters around the world, as well as several governments and key organizations, like the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, and the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN. The five people we're honoring have made key contributions. Zara Sayers, Eliezer Rabinovich, and Khalid Tukan played crucial roles in obtaining support from their respective member countries. Erwig Schopper and Chris Llewellyn Smith steered the boat through many storms and ensured a harmonious dialogue between the members. They were pivotal in advising on, advocating for, and securing international support for the project, as was Rabinovich. Sesame offers hope that, through science, we may be able to set aside our differences to ensure a better and more cooperative future together. Five Architects of Sesame, recipients of the 2019 AAAS Award for Science Diplomacy. Very impressive, and now it's my great pleasure to be able to present the 2019 AAAS Award for Science Diplomacy to those five architects of Sesame, Eliezer Rabinovici, Zara Sayers, Herwig Schoper, Christopher Llewellyn Smith, and to Khalid Tukan, who unfortunately cannot be with us this evening. Thank you.
terrific. I was a little concerned that they might break into dance or something, but um, a very exciting program and wonderful that they could be here with us um, to receive the award. So congratulations to the award winners. And uh, tomorrow, come back, because we'll have some more award presentations. But now I'd like to ask the panelists for our next session to come to the stage. And as they approach, I'll introduce them. First, Jean-Éric Paquet is Director General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, a position that he's held since April 2018. The Commission's Research and Innovation Department is responsible for European Union policy on research, science, and innovation with a view to help create growth and jobs and to tackle grand challenges. An expert in international and public policies, Director General Paquet has served in a variety of roles at the Commission for over 23 years. Welcome. And now, from South Africa, we have the Deputy Director General for International Cooperation and Resources at the Department of Science and Technology, Mr. Don Dutois, who's representing Minister Kubayi and Gubane, who unfortunately cannot join us. She sends her regrets, but she had important parliamentary affairs to handle back home. The Department of Science and Technology seeks to boost socioeconomic development in South Africa through research and innovation. Sir Mark Walpart, he is well known to us at AAAS and is currently Chief Executive of UK Research and Innovation. Sir Mark is the founding Chief Executive of UKRI, which formed last year and incorporates seven research councils Innovate UK and Research England. It's the primary science funder of the United Kingdom. And Sir Mark previously served as UK's chief science advisor and also as director of the Wellcome Trust. Knighted in 2009 for services to medical research, Sir Mark is an MD, PhD, and former professor of medicine at Imperial College London. Dr. Mona Niemer is Chief Science Advisor to the Government of Canada, having been appointed to the position by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in September 2017. Strikingly, she is the first person to occupy the role since 2008. Her mandate is to provide advice on issues related to science and to ensure that science is considered in policy decisions. Dr. Niemer is an expert in the field of molecular cardiology. Previously, she served as a professor and vice president of research at the University of Ottawa. And, and finally, from Japan, Dr. Michinari Hamaguchi is the president of the Japan Science and Technology Agency. JST is an advanced network-based institute that promotes state-of-the-art research and development projects. Dr. Hamaguchi is an MD, PhD, with a background in medical chemistry, and he previously served as the president of Nagoya University. Welcome. Okay, so now, um, we have really, I think, an exciting opportunity uh, to address an important issue that challenges uh, all governments and uh, requires leaders in positions like the individuals seated here uh, to, to think fast and act fast and to draw on their scientific resources to address important problems that challenge nations, uh, regions, and often the globe. As I mentioned at the beginning, the title is, of this session is Responding Faster and Smarter to New Problems. And I think we all recognize that we live in a rapidly changing world in which there are unexpected events, crises, that require this kind of rapid response. Um, sometimes ones that are familiar, 
um, and sometimes ones that could have been expected, and also ones that are completely unknown or unexpected. So this discussion is about dynamic challenges that scientific tools can help us surmount. Things like extreme weather, cybersecurity, and infectious diseases are just a few examples. And as leaders in government and heads of scientific agencies, we really want to hear from you about experiences that you've had that have led you to think more deeply about these kinds of problems and responses, where you have been able to make effective responses, and things that you have learned that can inform the work of others. So I have asked each of our representatives here to speak just briefly about an experience that they've had or an issue in leadership uh, that comes to mind in the context of responding faster and smarter to new problems. And then we'll have a discussion. So. Maggie, thank you very much. Um, public uh, research programs indeed are not uh, famous for being very reactive. Um, I think we also heard yesterday um, the American Chamber of Commerce uh, speaker saying that public uh, programs sometimes can also be slow and cumbersome. Uh, I think they are in reality quite thorough programs where uh, when we make funding available for science, you expect, and I think um, citizens and funders also expect, a thorough review and a proper planning for it. And this means that indeed making research funding available if you want on the ground uh, does take time, and it's true that uh, in European programs, uh, a normal lead time between the moment where you prioritize um, a, a research uh, a purpose uh, or project and the moment when the funding is indeed available uh, for research teams, you count several months, uh, when stars align around six months. Uh, in, but this is indeed a, a very long lead time in cases of emergency, um, and we have, I think, been able to demonstrate in a number of cases, and the one I want to use, Maggie, is the Ebola outbreak of 2014, uh, where uh, European programs uh, were able, in a matter of a few months, uh, to make uh, funding available on the ground. Uh, why does it sometimes take a bit of time? It's also because European programs are, of course, um, developed and agreed between 28 nations, uh, and that also uh, is a process um, which needs to be properly handled. But in the cases of the Ebola uh, outbreak, uh, once CWHO had declared uh, it a public emergency in August of 2014, all 28 uh, European member states decided that this needed to be acted on immediately, and we were able, in, in less than three months, to ensure that funding uh, was available for researchers, and that led, um, uh, uh, in the course of the autumn uh, of that year, mobile um, diagnostic uh, tools to be made available on the ground uh, to deal with uh, the outbreak. Uh, on top of that, um, uh, European partnerships were also mobilized. We have the Innovative Medicines Initiative in Europe where uh, European public funding um, comes together, European programs, but also programs from uh, our member states. We team up uh, with industry for clinical trials. And around the Ebola outbreak, um, there was already a vaccine in the very early stage of development, uh, in fact, a vaccine developed by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, where um, it was agreed to put up funding. It was 140 million on the public side and another 100 from industry. And early clinical trials were uh, carried out in these partnerships in, so to speak, real time. And that, I think, was um, uh, with the WHO response um, a, a, key, um, a key contribution uh, to keeping uh, the outbreak, uh, which claimed many lives, um, under check in the course of the years uh, that followed. Uh, I think there are a number of lessons which, uh, which can be learned from it. Um, firstly, that it can be done effectively. But what we also learned was that um, in, in the context of such an outbreak uh, for the population affected, uh, it was very difficult to be dealing with these diagnostics and also these um, uh, clinical trials and vaccines. And we brought in um, social scientists, uh, which help us, helped us then also to deploy a program of shows, radio programs, uh, to, to help um, affected populations to accept also uh, these emergency responses. And that was, I think, critical in the, in the impact which was, uh, which was delivered. Now, um, this was a, a crisis. Uh, the resources mobilized to be on the ground uh, so quickly 
were, of course, uh, very significant, both in terms of attention but also in terms of, of human resources. And we learned a number of lessons so as to embed these um, emergency responses in, more, in the more daily delivery of our programs. And we, we were able, in the case of the Zika uh, virus, for example, and in the more recent uh, short Ebola outbreak, we were able again to be um, uh, making resources available very quickly. So the lessons can also be learned a bit over time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now I want to turn to a different part of the world um, and a very different circumstance. Um, our colleague from South Africa, where uh, compared to you being responsible for 28 countries, you're one country but on a huge continent and, and uh, resource for the region, as well as, of course, a country um, uh, with uh, many challenges and, of course, many opportunities. So, uh, Don. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and, and please again accept the apology and the, the best wishes of, of my minister. Uh, three key messages from me. I would just like to tell you how we as a young democracy, we're 25 years old as a democracy this year, is organizing ourselves to, for uh, leverage science to respond to crises, give you some examples of, of how we've done that. And the point I would want to conclude with is to emphasize the importance of international cooperation and all of that. We as the Department of Science and Technology, we are that part of the South African government. We call ourselves the custodian of the national system of innovation. And by that, we mean all the sets of relationships and interfaces between government, private, public sector, academia, working together to make science work for society. And our context is one that, despite many achievements, is one of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And our key mission is to ensure that science system is responsive, responsive and agile, to address the, the needs for our society. So when it comes to crises, of course, we, we want to invest in people and make sure that we have the best scientists available to advance, to advise our government. And we do that through our Academy of Science and various advisory structures, that we also have the scientific infrastructure to draw upon. Um, for example, it may be counterintuitive for some that a developing country such as ours have a national space agency, but we have that national space agency in order for us to be able to draw on our own Earth observation capacities to inform resource management, disaster prevention. We are, for example, after only space weather station uh, in Africa. But in the key is really, and this is where, where the international learning is so important, is how do we put in place the effective translation and transmic mechanisms to ensure that uh, the scientific advice actually informs our government, including in times of crises. We like to call ourselves the, the apostles spreading the evangelism of scientific advice for policy making. Uh, in our, very early on in the life of our young democracy, we, we were confronted with the terrible scorch of the, the rapid spread of infectious diseases such as HIV AIDS, which called for a scientific response. Yes, investment in uh, vaccine and drug development, but very crucially also the contribution of social scientists. And we would not have achieved the successes in, in, in prevention and control through the world's largest antiretroviral program of HIV AIDS without a contribution of our social scientists. Uh, most recently, this was in, in the popular media last year, many in the audience would have read about a Cape Town water crisis where there were talks of day zero when Cape Town would run out of water. And again, that called for rapid response by our engineers, by our uh, natural resource management specialists, and again, including our social scientists, uh, in order to change behavior patterns with regard to, to water consumption. And I, I think the, the last crisis I would like to conclude with is not one which affects human life, but animal life. We, of course, have a proud uh, wildlife uh, uh, in, in, in South Africa, and uh, in the recent past, we were confronted with a crisis where very soon we would not have a rhino population because despite our best efforts to, to protect um, the, the, the pouching, we're, uh, we're, we're making uh, the disastrous inroads. So the scientific community had to respond very rapidly with drone technology, with big data anal anal analytics to, to, to safeguard that, that population. But of course, many of the challenges we speak to here, whether it's infectious disease, whether it's um, food security, energy security, those are global challenges. So also the science response must be a global one. And that's why South Africa, that's why we are here at AAAS. We are, we are deeply committed to international cooperation. With our friends in Europe, for example, we lead a group on Earth observation, which is all about putting Earth observation at, at the service of society. And I would just like to conclude to, to recall my former minister, who I was very proud to see on the screen, Minister Naledi Pandor, the recipient of the Science Diplomacy Award. And, and I, I remember distinctly discussions with fellow African ministers immediately after the outbreak of the Ebola crisis. And again, it, let me thank all 
international partners who contributed to the response to that crisis, where that crisis was also a call for, to arms for us in African science to ensure that we develop the capacities and the response mechanisms that we can share our equal burden when it comes to response uh, to these global crises. Thank you. Continuing our tour of the world, Sir Mark, you have sat in many different scientific leadership roles, and I know you have a few perspectives on this issue. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. I mean, first thing, going to the theme of the meeting, which is science transcending boundaries, many of the emergencies we're talking about transcend boundaries. And so international cooperation is absolutely key to a lot of what we're talking about. I just want to unpack for a second what we mean by new problems, because there is a different tempo of response needed according to the nature of the problem. So I think most of our discussion is going to be about emergencies. And there are so many emergencies where science, engineering, technology, the social sciences, as, as we've already heard, and also history, learning from what's happened before, is extremely important. And we've heard a bit about epidemic and pandemic infection. I would particularly pick out Ebola through a social science through a slightly different aspect of it, which is that anthropology played an extremely important part in controlling the spread of infection. Uh, because there were these clusters of infection emerging in different parts of the affected region, and no one knew quite what was going on. But it turned out that it was to do with burials. And the custom in West Africa is with burials that people show respect by touching the corpse. And in fact, the higher the status of the individual, the more people touch the corpse. And unfortunately, with Ebola, people are most infectious when they're at their illest and indeed just after they've died. And so it was anthropologists that understood that was going on, and it was anthropologists that were able to prepare the culturally sensitive advice about how to change burial habits, because these are actually deeply culturally embedded. It's easy to say, don't touch the corpse, but actually, if that's an important part of your cultural traditions, that needs to be handled very carefully. So infections, there are the geophysical emergencies, space weather, volcanic eruptions, flooding, um, and environmental emergencies, pollution. But I think we should also think for a second about a second type of new problem, which has a slower time scale, where frankly we will have emergencies if we don't think well in advance. So there I'm thinking about environmental ch challenges such as climate change, the challenges of clean energy, pollution, plastics, more invisible pollution in the form of gases such as nitrogen dioxide. And of course, then there's a, a group of technologies which sort of fall somewhere between the two. So cybersecurity, we're seeing the internet uh, creating a whole series of unexpected consequences which have the potential to become emergencies. So issues around privacy, antisocial behavior, bullying, harassment, fake news. All of these things are very important. Now, I think there are some common denominators both to the emergencies and the ones with longer timescale. So firstly, the challenge is typically multidisciplinary. And since people are involved, almost invariably there's a social science aspect as well as a natural science component of some sort. The second issue is that knowledge is typically incomplete and may be contested. And one of the emergency responses is not as it were, it's not helpful for researchers to come along to policymakers struggling with an emergency and say, if you give me a big grant, I'll come back in five years and tell you the answer when you've got an infection raging. And so that takes me to a second issue, which is evidence synthesis is absolutely critical in managing emergencies. It's not necessarily what the latest paper shows, it's what the synthesis shows. And for a science advisor trying to help a policymaker, what's needed is knowledge of what is known, what are the certainties, what are the uncertainties, and that such, and what don't we know. So uh, secondly, and, that, and what follows from that is that a link between science and policymakers is essential. There needs to be a transmission mechanism. So in terms of how we tackle these things, I think, again, there are a few key principles. So firstly, if we can anticipate the next emergency, that's actually quite helpful. We're great at managing the last one, not so good at ensuring against the next one. So horizon scanning, I think, is an extremely important activity. Um, secondly, we mustn't forget the powerful role of discovery. So funders have got to be flexible, they've got to be able to fast to respond, they've got to be catalytic. And so when we do need to find out new things in a hurry, then actually funders have got to be rapidly responsive. 
Um, as far as that mechanism for transmission between the world of research and policymakers, I've grown up in a system where uh, there is a, a sort of powerful uh, chief scientific advisor network of scientific advisor mechanisms. And there, the role of the scientific advisor isn't to know everything. No one can do that. It's actually know where to get advice, to know to find people who can communicate clearly to policy makers. And I think this is extremely important, so an intermediary. The next thing is effective science communication in the face of an emergency. And this is a real challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a particular problem at the moment, is how do you get sane voices out amidst a cacophony? Um, and here, too, I think transmission mechanisms can help. So in the UK, uh, Fiona Fox pioneered something called the Science Media Centre, which was a forum where, in an emergency, scientists, researchers could be brought together to talk to science journalists. And that's, and in fact, the AAAS has something very similar, which you were talking about last night, Peggy. Um, and then finally, I'd say, just say, talking about UK research and innovation itself, which is um, uh, the aggregation under a single umbrella of the funding agencies in the UK. So our seven research councils, our innovation agency, Innovate UK, and part of our dual support system. One of our jobs and one of the motivating forces when Paul Nurse produced his report that resulted in the formation of UK Research and Innovation was the need to be able to tackle research questions that come from the world of policy. Because we are funded by the taxpayer and actually we have a duty to do our best to be able to answer questions in the face of different emergencies. Um, and I would just end on the point, I think, that um, horizon scanning is absolutely critical to try and work out what might happen. Um, but at the end of the day, if we're going to be able to tackle all the new problems we face, we've got to support constant discovery, new ideas, and innovation. Thank you. Let's just go to Mona now. <coughs> well, um, thank you very much, and thanks for having me here. As you said, uh, I've been on the job for less than uh, a year and a half, yet I've come to two meetings already of <laughs> AAAS. So, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the great relationship that we have uh, developed over, uh, over this time and uh, also thank all my colleagues uh, everywhere, European Union, the UK, Sir Mark and, and uh, others who have helped me to actually get the office set up uh, you know, properly to be able to, um, to deal with emergencies. Thankfully, I did not have to deal with emergencies the first uh, year which was a good thing, gave me the opportunity to start putting in place uh, the proper building blocks. And uh, as Sir Mark uh, mentioned, I think there are two important issues. One is that of the network, where do you turn to get uh, quick uh, expertise and, and, um, and response and advice to the chief science advisor? And the second one is the communication. So in terms of the, the communication, I think a very important aspect in crisis is the credibility of the spokesperson of the communication and of the actions that governments are taking, making sure that they are really um, supported by evidence. So to deal with this, uh, one of my first tasks in, um, in government has been to develop a whole of government science integrity policy. And the science integrity policy basically um, ensures that government scientists are able to speak publicly about their work and their areas of, uh, of interest and ensures also that the science that's being conducted is conducted without any undue interference. So it, uh, I think, frames very well uh, the responsibilities of the employer and also of the scientists. And I think that judging from the, the, the public um, reaction to when we released the, the, the policy, I think it was a very important step. It was, uh, it was uh, very well welcomed by the public. The second one, uh, yes, I think it deserves that. <laughs> the, 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 the second uh, aspect was actually um, having the, the proper network. Of course, I knew a lot of colleagues in many areas, but uh, that doesn't work in crisis situation. So after looking at a number of models, I, uh, I concluded that the UK model uh, that has actually served the, 
the country very well for over 50 years is, uh, is a very good one to, um, to emulate in Canada. And it involves having sci a science advisor in every department. So immediately you have a network of complementary expertise that can be called upon and then you can uh, bring together uh, at the scientific level the appropriate advice uh, to, uh, to government. So uh, I've made that recommendation. I'm happy to say that the government and the Minister of Science has actually endorsed uh, this and we started to, uh, to roll out uh, science advisors in various departments. We already have five departments on board. So it's been a very interesting year, you know, to put the, the, the like I said, the building blocks to face emergencies. I hope we never face them, but uh, I think that we're equipping ourselves to be able to face them. Thank you. And Dr. Hamaguchi, our colleague from Japan, who uh, has had the experience in his country of having to deal with a major uh, uh, geophysical crisis followed by an additional crisis with the Fukuyama uh, nuclear plant that was damaged in an earthquake associated with a tsunami. So you have a lot of direct um, uh, experience, but um, Fukushima. Um, uh, and, um, and also a lot of other experience to share with us. So. Uh, unfortunately, Japan is rich in natural disasters. <laughs> really rich these years. For, for example, we had Tohoku earthquake in 2011, uh, followed by Kumamoto earthquake uh, 2016, Hokkaido in 2018, last year. And also we have severe flooding in 2018. We have many, many natural disasters or almost every year. And in, and in this case, uh, for, for example, Tohoku earthquake, we lost more than 20,000 people. And around 2,000 people, we miss uh, their body after eight years. We cannot find them. And most of them are killed by a tsunami. It's a wave, but not a wave. It comes almost 30 meters high, higher than this ceiling, and it's a kind of monster suddenly attack your life. And you lose your family, your friend, your job, your home, everything, your culture, even the culture disappear. And what remain is the reality. And uh, what we found is uh, science to study the mechanism of our space is very important. And we need to offer the hazard map. But this is not enough. There is another role for science and technology that is uh, even after the disaster, we should try to support people directly from the science and technology side. Uh, and there are many ways, depends on the phase. In the acute phase, what we found is critical point, turning point was education. Uh, we have a story called uh, Kamai Shimiraku. Uh, JST supported uh, Kamai uh, Elementary School to, to teach them how to evacuate fr uh, from the tsunami. But teaching the data itself is not uh, enough because tsunami for this area comes once thousand years. You cannot believe it comes in your age. It's not real, but it comes. When it comes suddenly and directly, and for, to save the school children, just teaching hazard map is not enough. We need 
what we found is practice to make the prepared mind for them. Mm -hmm. And the Kamai Elementary School, almost 100% of school children survived, even though they had a huge, high tsunami. But uh, another school, only 5% survived, 100% versus 5%. This is a reality we experienced. So education, ju just teaching the knowledge is not enough. Practice and confidence and prepared mind is important. It's a critical point. Now, another point we found, even the Fukushima area, they suffered from the nuclear plant accident. Even after the accident, most of people want to stay at their homeland. They love their homeland. And they love their daily life, simple life. And what I found is very simple daily life is, is really important for people. It's the core of the happiness, prosperity. So what we tried is a kind of revitalization program to uh, support their job with high tech and to offer technique to uh, survey the area whether uh, there was no radiation or not. This kind of activity was very important to recover their feeling that they are safely living in the homeland. I think uh, cutting edge research is very important, but sometimes we try it, uh, I would say, in a way, in endless game by cool mind. But in addition to cool mind, we need a uh, warm heart to, to support people through our specialty that's, that's what we found, and we, we, we should try more after the accident. That's what I want to tell you okay. today. Well, thank you. And I think your point about... <laughs> you know, a lot of really important elements of preparedness and response and... and, and crisis intervention have been raised. I sort of want to follow up on your last um, discussion about education yes. as one important aspect of, of helping people to better respond when a crisis occurs. There are many other important aspects of preparedness as well. Uh, Dr. Namir mentioned about um, uh, working on, on exercises and um, and trying to, and uh, Sir Mark also talked about bringing people together ahead of time. We had an expression here about not wanting to be exchanging business cards in the middle of a crisis, and I think that's, that's so important. In addition, um, a critical issue of how do we ensure that the messages get across in a crisis and uh, we were talking a little bit before this um, session began, but about how social media and, and cable news and you know, the sort of changing world we live in is making it harder um, to respond to crises. And all of you are representatives of the sort of scientific end of the, the response, um, but how do we coordinate the access to science, the harnessing of the science to what needs to be communicated uh, to the public before, during, and after crisis, and how do we ensure the trust in the science, and how do we ensure the trust in government that's so essential throughout this whole process. So maybe I'll just ask all of you to, to quickly provide some thoughts on that. Well, I think, um I think you, you, you put it rightly, it's an issue of trust, of, of building general trust in science 
and also trust that the, the policy makers will be using uh, science and knowledge to base their action on. And that's something which you don't uh, generate in crisis time, that you need to have prepared. Uh, and I think indeed um, in, in the European Union, uh, the, the hallmark of policy making is evidence based. We have invested over the last 15 years massive eff efforts and resources in creating visible, uh, publicly discussed, uh, engaging citizens on creating this evidence base. And science is, of course, a key contribution to that evidence base, which is why, uh, like in the UK, uh, in Canada, we, we have um, scientific advice, which is available. And not only is it available, but we also ensure that it is visible and that the contribution with the scientific advice makes is uh, debated uh, politically, including also seen as being debated um, by citizens. That's the way you, you build that trust, which then would allow, I suppose, in periods of crisis, um, to, to be able to better use that scientific advice. Thank you. Maybe I'll actually turn to you, Don, because you had this recent crisis with the water shortage, um, which, um, in our earlier discussion you were saying was both an example of how science could have been harnessed better um, in order to prevent the full scope of the problem, but also it must have been an extremely difficult problem to manage as it was unfolding because, you know, access to water is something that is pretty important to the public and when they can't get it, um, their trust in in the government that serves them must erode fairly quickly. Yeah. Well, well m most certainly. I, um, indeed, there, there had been uh, many predictions and, and, and scientific advice which, which didn't find its way into the decision making at appropriate stage, which could certainly have alleviated some of the impact of that crisis. I mean, the, the crisis was in a sense a perfect storm, a combination of various factors, including, in, in, including severe drought. But what that did was that we have very vibrant public debate with um, scientific opinion, not only in the specialist media, but in, in, in the pop popular media. And that certainly contributed, I think, to uh, in, instilling the broader South African public's uh, trust and, and confidence and, and, and being aware of the important contribution our, our science, scientific uh, c c community has, has to make. Uh, that is a consistent effort for us. Science has a role to, to play in responding to many of the societal challenges we face, not, not least food security. And when it comes to introducing technology for drought uh, and disease uh, resistance crops, that there needs to be a constant engagement with, with, with the public. So we, we have a dedicated agency, South African Agency for Advancement of Science and Technology, whose core mission is to communicate science to the public and build that public awareness and understanding of the science. And that, that's precious capital when it comes to crises such as the, uh, such as the water one we've confronted. Thank you. I think one area that we don't talk uh, enough about is the dialogue between science and policy. Because before, you know, the, the politicians and, and others make a decision, they need to understand the science that is being inputted there. And we take it for granted that this happens organically and uh, everything is good. But I think that we, you know, it's an area where we need to work on. Uh, a lot of the policy makers, when, they're, that when they hear uncertainty, they don't know necessarily how to deal with it and, uh, you know, which way to, uh, to weigh the decision. And that's why we hear things like uh, science does not, does not inform policy or does not dictate. It's an uh, aspect of it. It only informs. But, you know, if you look at uh, science in a broad perspective, economic, you know, development, uh, natural sciences, sociology, of, they're, they're the, the elements of a decision making. But I think that we have a lot of work that needs to be done, you know, to enhance that dialogue among the scientists and the policy makers. But I, there are some very serious issues, I think, around the communication. So, I mean, there's no alternative in a way in an emergency. You have to coordinate your communications. You have to have people who are trained. You have to get the researchers who are capable of communicating out there. Um, the challenge comes when the sort of science conflicts with people's values. And I think there is a new risk that in the world of uh, cyberspace, 
uh, there is the opportunity for malevolent people to actually deliberately distribute and amplify misinformation. And I think it's part of the challenges that we face around the moment around fake news. Um, and, I mean, an interesting example, going back to Fukushima, was the whole question, as, as we've heard, people died of the tsunami. They didn't die of the radiation. Um, there was quite a lot of anxiety, and that's maybe an understatement, after the event about the possible radiation exposure. One of the, the consequences, uh, and it was my predecessor as government chief scientific advisor, John Beddington, got together plume modelers and meteorologists at the time of the tsunami and was able to work out that the likely exposure to radiation in Tokyo was much less than you would have had if you'd got on a flight and gone from Tokyo to London. And so I think it is about this mixture of proper scientific analysis coupled with very, very clear communication. But as I say, I think it's difficult not to worry that there are new vulnerabilities around communication with the ability of social media to amplify false messages. Thank you. And you've lived through a number of crises, as you mentioned, um, and you know, the, the challenge in terms of the communication, the challenge of, of how to uh, really deal with, with the responses of people in the acute episode and also, you know, we sometimes forget, we respond to the crisis in the moment, but the, the period following the crisis and the remediation and the, the cleanup and the getting back to normal and reestablishing both routines and trust again in, in certain systems is a, is a difficult issue. Maybe you can shed some light on that. I have two points I want to tell you. Uh, uh, after the uh, Tohoku earthquake, uh, most of Japanese lost uh, trust to the science. And uh, the reason why uh, some part scientists has uh, responsibility because we misconducted that earthquake can be predictable. It's impossible with the present technique to predict when and how and uh, what kind of disaster comes we have some limitation, so we have to be honest about this limitation. Mm -hmm. But if we leave that we have many limitations in science and technology, again, people don't trust us. Mm -hmm. We have to show, we, although we are limitation in the technology and the knowledge, we can do something, and that's a recovery phase, we can work together with citizens. In our case, uh, we, after the uh, earthquake, we developed a system to secure a certain amount of budget uh, that can be allocated flexibly as a funding agency directly and maintain their capacity to allocate funding to effective project immediately. And we discuss what we can do with our technique. And also, we repeated more than 100 times a discussion with high school students, citizens, uh, what we are facing and how, how we can survive, how can we can recover our daily life. These kind of approaches was very, very important for the recovery phase. Now, uh, many Japanese trust science again. And, and I don't know whether our activity was effective or not, but anyway, we need it. Great. And sort of along these same lines, we had the advantage of talking amongst ourselves before this panel, but you were um, mentioning about how you had an unexpected crisis in terms of it wasn't an infectious disease, it wasn't an earthquake, it wasn't a flood, yeah. it was an attack of xenophobia, as you described yeah. it, mm -hmm. and that you really had to draw Indeed. on a different kind of yeah. science, on social science, to understand yeah. how to respond. Just as in the Ebola, they had to draw upon social science and anthropologic science in order to really 
um, have a better sense of yeah. how to appropriately respond. Indeed, crises manifest themselves in, in, dif in different forms. And in a, in a, in a challenging socio-economic environment, uh, uh, these, these, these tensions led to, to conflict between immigrant communities and some of our local communities, and there needed to be a concerted response from our government, um, uh, not least to respect the values for which our country and our constitution stood for. And that including related to the, the science of the communication. Uh, 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 and we had uh, very specific interventions, uh, for example, using social media applications, which our mobile technology laboratory was, was tasked to develop in order to reach out to, to, to communities and, and clarify, provide communities with the facts in, in, in order to, to, to appease the tensions which, which had, uh, had arisen. And I, I think the, 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 core, the core message why a country such as South Africa in, invests in science Social science, science, natural science, scientific capacity. So those, those are tools which are at the disposal of our government to serve in whatever situation we have to confront. Thank you. Let me change gears just a little bit. You know, we've, we've been talking about issues that all of you have, have faced or been thinking about within your own countries. Do you think given the nature of many of these challenges and also the changing world that we live in, that we need new systems internationally to work on these kinds of issues together? Do we need a new global governance mechanism for information sharing, for research and innovation investments potentially in critical areas of need? Or do we have enough existing systems uh, to, to deal with, with these issues? Because increasingly we recognize how interdependent we are um, mm -hmm. We also, I think, recognize that in some areas of preparedness, if every country tried to do the research and innovation to create all of the vaccines we might need against potential pandemic th threats, or to create all of the new systems of geophysical monitoring that might help with other kinds of, of events, that you know, the resources would simply outstrip all the other needs of, of, of your nations or your regions. So I'm just curious, you know, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, since you already are dealing with working across 28 nations, do you think we need better systems for coordinating, collaborating, and really uh, investing in, in critical assets on a global scale? Yeah, well, I think the answer needs to be yes, uh, and certainly a big yes. Uh, the, the, the challenges we are facing, and I would start, of course, with the Anthropocene, with climate change, biodiversity, pollution, uh, is dealt with at global level uh, and needs to be dealt with at global level, as much, of course, as solution will remain largely local. And we are doing that, um, I think, broadly, uh, but certainly not enough. So uh, I, I would certainly... Um, hope that uh, we can see a much more um, international cooperation in both uh, sharing knowledge and science, that's honestly the easy part, uh, but then in coming together also to develop uh, solutions, including technological solutions, which can then be deployed on a broad scale. And this is already much more difficult because this is about uh, agreeing collectively or internationally on deploying scarce resources for common challenges. Uh, not to mention that obviously the analysis of the challenge to be tackled can be quite different according um, to the various partners which are trying to come together. It is, I think, particularly obvious that this needs to happen and is happening in the area of health. Um, uh, we have discussed early on uh, diseases and the Ebola crisis. And as a result of the international mobilization in Africa and with Africa, um, in between 2014 and 15, there is now a global preparedness network which exists um, where we are sharing data, uh, science data as well, uh, to be better prepared. And another obvious example is uh, orphan diseases, where obviously none of us, uh, even as big a country as the United States, uh, can go it alone. So yes, there needs to be certainly um, more international cooperation. 
So the direction is clear. However, the way uh, and the means and the organizations, I think, um, are not as easy to mobilize um, as the direction. And I think this is um, where more, uh, more work and I think maybe more mobilization also from the scientific communities would help policymakers to, to, to go uh, and make these choices. Great. Looks like you want to make a comment here. Well, I, I was just speculating as to whether a United Nation of researchers would be any better than a United Nation of politicians. <laughs> um, but I, I think the serious point is it's obviously the case that we need to collaborate internationally. And I think jean Eric has said something important, which is actually about the openness of science. And I think that's one of the sort of key values. It really does matter that we share data. And, and I've been struck, to be honest, that in infectious diseases where everyone's been very happy to share sequences outside emergencies of bacteria and viruses and things like that, when there was a flu pandemic, then suddenly sharing became a problem again. Yeah. Um, because of, in some cases, perfectly reasonable anxieties that if a poor country with influenza shared its sequence, money would be made elsewhere, the vaccine would be made elsewhere, and they wouldn't get the benefit of the vaccine. So I think that there are some serious issues. But I mean, it's, it's, in a sense, it's blindingly obvious that we need to collaborate internationally. I suspect that we need to do it in domain-specific areas. In other words, I don't think that there is a general body that could do this, mm -hmm. but I think that we can see that in infectious diseases world, the vaccine world is doing rather well at the moment, actually, and Ebola is a good example where EU funding, I think, was extremely important, actually. Um, and so it seems to me, but, but I, when it comes to sort of clean growth, um, I think that there's still too much of a problem in collaborating, and when you take the big global challenges, there's a lot more to do. Um, but uh, researchers are humans, and uh, humans sometimes find it quite difficult to collaborate, which is a pity. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that it's, uh, it's clearly that we need to do a better job at, uh, at sharing, and when you talk about data sharing, you talk about standardization, about access, and uh, in a number of things that need to be proactively looked after, because it's not in the crisis situation that you have time to you know, to, to be looking at things and translating what it means from one data set to the other data set. So I think there is a, a, a something that needs to be done there. Um, we, we talk about uh, you know, perhaps a response to a crisis, but we can also talk about the preventing a crisis. So what do we do upstream? And uh, for sure, it, it has to be uh, area specific, but I'll give you an example of uh, microplastics because uh, we had a meeting with the, with the G7 and it started actually as a collaboration with the science advice group of the European uh, Union. And, um, you know, mi microplastic is a global issue. Uh, regulating and cleaning up uh, international waters is something that, you know, needs to be looked after. And um, there's just so much gap in the knowledge about the impact of microplastic on the environment, on health, that not a single country you know, or continent can ever put enough resources to address the issue. So I think that having uh, you know, coordinated uh, action at the level already of research, making sure that we don't end up with gaps that because everybody's looking at the same issue and putting all the resources in one area, I think is very important. And this is where uh, granting agencies like UKRI, like uh, you know, all the agencies that we have uh, in our countries have a very important role to play as well in preparing us and in preventing uh, emergencies and, and others. You know, I'm interested in terms of international cooperation in some of the, the crises that you've had to respond to. Did you feel supported by your colleagues from other countries? Did you feel that there was an international response that, that was useful to you and you had access to scientists and information and perhaps other resources that you needed or, or did, you, did you feel gaps? Uh, in our case, in case of the Tofok earthquake, we are very much supported by United States. And many marine people come just after the earthquake to support us. This is a typical case, and we have also a program when we have found any earthquake in Asian region, 
we collaborate with uh, university research of the uh, countries and, and collaborate to uh, assess the damage and mechanisms and to support them. This uh, uh, program is uh, uh, very active. And for example, recent case is the Indonesian uh, tsunami recent we had. We already launched the program to support them. And we need the collaboration because disaster comes across the border. <laughs> it, it has no niche. <laughs> We need, and we have to exchange uh, information. We should be open for, op for the mechanism and effect as a open, like uh, open science. We need system, but it is not yet uh, complete. We, we need this international discussion. This is the point. Mm -hmm. And in Africa, you have, oh. No, no, I was, I was just going to say that, um, there are now, of course, there's global monitoring, which was never there at a scale before. So satellites now provide uh, yes, a stream of information, which in terms of monitoring geophysical events is unparalleled in history. And there's just mm. a huge opportunity there. Yeah. And that really can be done globally. And increasingly, we're observing the whole planet every day. You want to tell the story about the dam in Brazil? I thought. Well, I mean, it, it, <laughs> I mean, the answer is that, of course, with um, looking at the space and using interferometry, one can actually see Earth shifting. And so it's possible now, in principle, to monitor dams remotely and look and see if, for example, uh, 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 the tailings dam, the terrible tragedy in Brazil, um, if that can be anticipated in advance. And again, that comes down from the fact that we can now monitor shifts of the Earth very sensitively from space continuously. And there was a breakage of a dam in Brazil that Ab absolutely. caused a absolutely. lot of damage yeah, that absolutely. maybe could have been prevented had that kind had of that monitoring been, yeah. been routinely going on. I was going to ask you about in Africa, and we've been talking you know, about a number of infectious disease threats, yes. and certainly Africa has had more than its share, and in a, in a set of countries that often don't have the robust infrastructure yeah even in terms of basic health care or laboratory networks, surveillance, whatever. I know that Africa has recently been trying to work on a broader, the countries of Africa have come together, for example, to create a, an African Centers for Disease Control Indeed. and then an African uh, Drug Regulatory Agency. Um, I don't know, you know if you've been following those activities closely, but you know, it, it's, it's a striking yeah. shift that seems to of make course. sense in, in the modern era? Of course, I mean, international cooperation is imperative and we need to enhance in international cooperation. And it's, it's very important that also at a continental and, and regional level, those partnerships are strengthened. And even though we are able to depend on, on, on reliable and strong partnerships, we know as Africans, we need to invest in increasing and building our own capacity. So within the broader framework of the African Union, there are a number of initiatives. Um, there's a science and technology innovation strategy for Africa, whether it's in uh, food security, whether it's in, in disease, wh uh, whether it's uh, in, in, for example, in natural resource management, various institution building is taking place. So for example, we are sponsoring a, a, a networks of excellence for water research and, and innovation. You refer to the examples in the health field. There are a number of initiatives um, to develop pan-African research funding instruments. So very much inspired by some of the examples that we have in Europe, we often speak of building an African, African research area. So these, these are very, very exciting times nice. for African science. But I, and that, that is, uh, I think, an opportunity and a resource also for the global community. Because if we're going to address these this shared global challenges, it's important that, that we draw on this talent and scientific resources uh, of our, our planet as a whole. But certainly uh, we're a continent of 55 countries with varying socioeconomic and development and other capacities. And there are a number of countries where there, there's a need for real support for building capacity. And I think in, in this part of the 20th, 21st century, um, some of the best investments one can make through development cooperation programs within the context of the Sustainable Development Goals is to invest, invest in scientific capacity building. Because after all, if there, there's one thing which renders our planet more fragile, which renders us more vulnerable to the impact of crisis, is inequality. And it's in everyone's interest to address this global inequality. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's maybe I'd like to add, you know, on this one that said that definitely scientific capacity is so essential. Mm -hmm. Another area of collaboration uh, that we haven't talked about enough and given the award to, to Sesame is actually the, the large unique facilities around the world. So we each have, you know, different type of facilities that can be put uh, uh, as well to serve the, mm -hmm. the global um, benefit and the global good. And I think that uh, having protocols for sharing infrastructure and uh, collaborating by, you know, using co common tools, I think is a great area as well to look at. Yeah. Where a lot is happening. Yeah, yeah well, this is, uh, I think, such an important set of issues and so much opportunity. One of the things that does happen in a crisis is that there, there, there may be an inequitable distribution of a critical and limited resource. I mean, you were mentioning mm -hmm. the, the problem of data sharing yeah. in a, in a um, pandemic flu context and limited supply of vaccine. And one of the hardest issues is, is do you protect your own country's population in terms of access to a limited resource or do you target um, the, the countries that are currently affected to try to contain a problem at the site if it's something like a global pandemic? And that's, you know, I think a, a challenge that uh, is very hard to exactly prepare for or plan for. But, um, you know, since you raised the issue with the, um, the vaccine example and, and sharing of data in, in pandemic flu, uh, you know, how, is, how, how have you thought about that issue in terms of you have resources for, for producing these products um, and how should they be distributed worldwide? Well, I mean, it's a really interesting question. So, I mean, it's always said that the first duty of a government is to protect its citizens. And so there is a natural political drive to actually look after the citizens. So how does one deal with the trade-offs? And surely we're now in a world where manufacturing is changing. And we're now in a world where manufacturing can be distributed. And so this is where I think we need to plan ahead and recognize that if we are going to be able to provide vaccines for the world, we've got to distribute the vaccine manufacturing facilities. And in an era of increasingly sort of DNA-based um, vaccines and, and uh, protein expression, etc. Um, the technology for doing this is much more available. So I, th I think that we're never going to get away from that instinct of a government to look after its citizens, which is actually a perfectly proper motivation. And therefore, I think we've got to get around the problem, as it were, by recognizing it's about planning in advance, isn't it? It is actually about uh, horizon scanning identifying this as an issue and saying, if we're going to crack this problem, then we've got to manufacture vaccines in a distributed way around the world and actually plan them at a scale that can protect global populations. And of course, pandemic influenza certainly is the top risk on the UK's national risk register. Mm. But, but sometimes, you know, protecting your citizens is maybe containing the pandemic where, where it is, you know, the, the most... Uh, Severe before it gets out to your population. That's perfectly true, but in the case of flu, you can't do that. I mean, it's the nature of flu that it transmits before you become infectious. And so, yes, if you're going to control something, you, you need to control it at source. That just doesn't quite work for flu. That's the problem. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time, um, and this has been a fascinating conversation, which I think you know, could go on much longer. Uh, all of you have hard jobs because the minute a, a crisis emerges, suddenly, you know, it rests on you and uh, it's usually you can't win, either you do too much or you do too little. But, um, but I think that the importance of really being able to mobilize the best possible science to address these, these problems is key. The ability to be planning ahead and the ability to be working together, to be sharing lessons learned, uh, and to be able to support each other in a crisis, I think can't be underestimated. And we didn't talk about, and the clock is ticking, but the importance of also investing in the next generation who really are being trained to think about these problems and learning about these problems, um, because I suspect that all of you have had to learn about crisis management uh, 
on the fly in the midst of, of an outbreak or a, a flood or a tsunami. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging activity and certainly one where it's hard to make the best possible decisions. So I really applaud all of you for the leadership and vision and energy you've brought to your roles and uh, to responding to crises big and small in your countries. I hope that all of you are thinking about how the work you do can help strengthen governments at the local uh, state and uh, federal level as well as the international collaboration so that we have better tools and uh, better abilities to share and collaborate and inspired also by the Science Diplomacy Award that began our session, the notion of really how important science is in solving some of the most important problems that face our world today. So thank you very much for coming and thank you to the panelists.